Hello, welcome back adventurers. So today we're going to be doing things a little bit different. Um, previously in this class, we've divided each realm into two lectures, one looking at the overall physical aspects in terms of um, topography and mountains and such, and also looking at some of the history and overall aspects of a realm, maybe religion and language. And then the second lecture has been uh, focused more on individual countries. Today's lecture, our realm, the Austral realm, is only consists of two countries, Australia and New Zealand. And therefore, we're going to cover the entire realm in just one lecture. So you might have heard of the Austral realm, also referred to as Down Under. And that is because the Austral realm is the only realm that is entirely in the Southern Hemisphere. So the word Austral comes from the Latin word for South. Um, as I mentioned, there are only two states in this realm. It's just Australia and New Zealand. Um, and then there are a series of islands. So Australia itself is a country. It is a giant island and it is the world's smallest continent. So kind of unique in that it has those three aspects. Um, with the current state of where our OFC level is at, these islands are not um, connected to other realms by land. So for example, previous realms we've seen were um, shared borders with other realms. So for example, our North Africa realm was connected to the Sub-Saharan African realm and divided by the African transition zone or the Sahel. Um, our European realm and our Russian realm were connected and divided by um, the Ural and Caucasus mountains. Um, we're not going to have that land connection here. We'll see that parts of this realm were previously connected to other parts of um, land, but are currently now not. The only way to access these um, islands of Australia and New Zealand is by boat or by plane. Um, there are other smaller islands. So for example, Tasmania is an island that is part of the Australian country. Uh, New Zealand itself is made up of two islands, the North Island and the South Island. And there are, of course, um, lots of smaller islands that are part of Australia. Uh, we're not going to talk about um, the Pacific Island as a whole today. That's a whole separate lecture. So we'll go talking about um, Tonga and Fiji and Samoa in a separate lecture here. Okay, so let's first let's go ahead and look at some of the physical landscape here. Um, being that this is a very island-heavy um, realm, we do of course have some oceans involved, and that's going to be the Indian Ocean here in the south. And then you can't quite see it because the map cuts off, but we have the Pacific Ocean is going to be off to the side um, to the east of New Zealand. There are a whole series of seas that are dividing up the different aspects of this realm. So notably the Tasman Sea is going to be dividing Australia and New Zealand. If you go a bit farther north, we have the Coral Sea, which divides Australia from the Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, and other um, New Caledonia, for example, other parts of Pacific or Southeast Asia. And again, we do have some islands through here that are part of Australia. Uh, we have the Timor Sea, which divides East Timor and Australia, and this has been a source of some conflicts, actually. So East Timor and Australia have been um, arguing over access to oil through here. And so if you remember um, in previous lectures, we talked about when it came to natural resources, um, countries can lay claim to whatever resources are beneath their boundaries. But it gets more complicated when we get to um, ocean boundaries because maritime law treats... Um, treats uh, it depends on how far how many miles out you are from an island that belongs to that country and so it gets more complicated here when we saw the same issue in the south china sea with different countries trying to lay claim to different islands in order to expand their maritime boundaries which would then give them access to things like oil things that are below the ocean and then we also have the Arafura Sea, which is dividing Australia from um, Indonesia and parts of New Guinea. Previously, when ocean levels were lower, Papua New Guinea and Australia actually were connected, which we'll see some similarities in animals that we find here as well. We have the Great Barrier Reef, which is going to be a coral reef off the coast of the, so the northeast coast of Australia. Um, you can see it from space. So uh, Great Barrier Reef, of course, is a very popular tourist destination. And coral are going to be an organism that is uh, seriously at threat as our um, oceans are getting warmer. So if you ever play the game of animal, vegetable, or mineral as a kid, um, the answer for coral is that it's actually all three. And so um, coral itself is actually an animal. 
um, but they create their skeletons on the outside. They have an exoskeleton that's made of calcium carbonate. And um, so it's kind of like a, a, a calcium rock-like structure. And so when you see a coral reef, it actually is a whole series of skeletons of, of animals that are building on top of each other. Okay, and so you have that rock-like structure. Coral looks like rock because it's basically skeletal remains. And then the brilliant colors that we have on our coral, part of that is from algae, which is going to be a plant. And so when you have corals, at least the type uh, that we see in the Great Barrier Reef, um, that get a lot of food from photosynthesis because the algae that are cohabiting with the coral, so it's a symbiotic relationship, will actually perform photosynthesis and share that food with the animal coral. So it's like having a roommate who cooks for you all the time. It's pretty great. <laughs> the animal provides the skeletal house and the algae provides the food. Um, coral bleaching is something that we see happening in the Great Barrier Reef. And coral bleaching is when coral turns all white, which means that it is dying. And one thing that causes this is, is going to be the warming of the ocean, ocean temperatures, and possibly also the increase of acidification, although I think more about the temperatures. And the stress makes the coral animal eject, evict the, the algae from their structure. And so they've lost their food source and then end up dying. Um, and so that's a concern here in Australia. I know there's been a lot of um, movement in other parts of the world to ban um, sunscreen because that those chemicals can have an impact on coral and other animals as well. Um, so these coral reefs are a very unique system that are threatened by our changing planet. So that we have on the other side of Australia is the Great Australian Bight, and that's this right here. So a bight, that term we don't use a whole lot in North America, although we do have bites here in North America. So a bight is kind of like a bay or a sound in that it's, um, it's shallower and more open and easier for ships to access. So for example, if you are familiar with uh, Southern California, Santa Monica Bay would classify as a bight. Okay, so you can see it definitely is still indented like a, a standard bay, but it's easy, it's, it's, it's more um, spread open, more wider access for some of the more shallow bays. It's harder for ships to get in there, but it's much more wider in access, and that's going to be your great Australian bite. The continent of Australia has a whole series of uh, deserts, of course, which we'll look at in more detail. Some of the largest of, is going to be the Great Victoria Desert. We also have the Simpson Desert, the Gibson Desert, and the Great Sandy Desert. And you'll notice Australia is going to be, uh, so for scale, the island of Australia is roughly the size of the lower 48 of the United States. And so you think about this central area here has less access to water, that maritime effect. We'll talk about that more in a bit of detail. Um, Australia itself is a, a generally a flatter country. It does have one um, large um, mountain range. That's going to be the Great Dividing Range here on the side here. Uh, Australia itself is going to be an older rock-like structure, and so it is lower in elevation. And the, the one high peak that it does have, which is Mount Kosciusko, is actually going to be pretty low. It's only 7,300 feet in elevation. That's not very high for a high peak. Um, by comparison, Mount Kilimanjaro in our last realm is 19,000 feet in elevation. So you can see how much lower Australia is. Um, we also, of course, have many mountains over in New Zealand, and uh, New Zealand's highest peak is Araki, is the native um, Maori name. Mount Cook is the European, Europeanized name, and that is going to be 12,200 feet. And so you already can see the difference between Australia's highest peak and New Zealand's highest peak is going to be quite considerable. And New Zealand has several peaks. So for example, Mount Tasman is 11,400 feet. So in general, New Zealand is more of a mountainous um, um, uh, country than Australia is. So even though there are only two countries in this realm, they actually are very, very different from each other, both in terms of their landscapes and in terms of their climate. And that's a lot of it's going to be related to um, their relationship to tectonic plates. So um, again, remember that once upon a time, all of our continents were all smooshed together in Pangaea, that was 225 million years ago. Um, <clears throat> But if you look at this tectonic plate here, Australia is going to be the center of the Indo-Australian plate. Um, and so all of these borders, the, the black lines here being the, the actual borders in between um, those plate boundaries, 
don't intersect with the island itself where the bulk of the people live. And so that means that the Australian continent is not experiencing a lot of the tectonic activity that we associate with tectonic plates. So for example, um, volcanoes and um, earthquakes are extremely rare in Australia. In fact, I don't know if there's ever been a recorded volcano in Australia. Um, they're very rare because they're just, there isn't um, that coverage from those plate boundaries. Okay, as we saw on the last slide, um, Australia is going to be an older rock continent, so much more eroded, lower in elevation. Again, their peak of Mount Kosciuszko is only 7,000 7, feet. That's not very high. Okay, in contrast to this, we have New Zealand, which is directly on <laughs> the plate boundary in between the Pacific Plate and the Indo-Australian Plate. So we have much, much more uh, tectonic activity happening in New Zealand. It is on the Ring of Fire. You can see here the Pacific Plate is going to be moving upwards. So going underneath Japan, underneath the Aleutian Trent, Trench. Okay, so New Zealand is absolutely part of that Ring of Fire. Um, you might remember the Christchurch earthquake, which I think was in 2012, I believe, um, was a pretty devastating earthquake. Uh, volcanoes do exist here as well. All the red dots are going to be our active volcanoes. So uh, a much more um, tectonically active landscape in New Zealand. And of course, it's going to be a very mountainous um, country as well. So already we saw their high peak of Aoraki was, uh, Aoraki was going to be over 12,000 feet. So considerably higher than um, Australia's highest peak here. Uh, and then the Southern Alps are going to be focused on the Southern Island New Zealand. So we have uh, the two islands are going to have a different amount of rockiness as well. If we look at climate, the two islands or two, yeah, two islands are also very different as well. So for example, New Zealand here, you can see is going to be much smaller and it is going to be much more influenced by the oceans around it. And so um, water moderates temperature. We call this the maritime effect. And so we think about, for example, the San Francisco Bay Area. We're right on at the ocean. And uh, we have pretty mild temperatures. And you might think, what are you talking about? It's freezing here, <laughs> right? We do have our Pacific Ocean. It's quite cold. Um, so yes, we are colder. Our, our summers are colder. But When's the last time that it snowed in San Francisco? It's been a while. So the presence of large bodies of water, these oceans, will make your summers cooler, but also will make your winters warmer. And that's why if you look at San Francisco, it's kind of always roughly, you know, 65 degrees Celsius, or Fahrenheit rather. Um, you don't get those 120 degree summers. We don't get snow in winters. And that's going to be the case for New Zealand as well. So uh, the majority, pretty much the entire country of New Zealand, actually, is going to be in that C, mild mid-latitude climate category. Um, so we do have um, some summer fog coming off the mountains. We do have some frost. But overwhelmingly, it's going to be um, cool, mild, um, no extremes. So they're not extremely hot, not extremely cold, and lots of rain. Okay, and that's going to help the agriculture in New Zealand as well. And that very much is going to be because of this ocean influence. Again, the maritime influence, presences of large bodies of water is going to mild and moderate your temperatures. Okay, so plenty of water here and nice, mild, uh, moderate temperatures. Um, we don't get the same instance with Australia. So again, a much larger island. So yes, we do have that, that mild influence here on the coast, but what about the central part of Australia? And this is going to be the continental effect. We see this in North America, we see this in Eurasia as well. When you have a large landmass, um, the center of it doesn't have access to that nice, moderating, mild ocean. Um, and so if you look at, for example, Central Asia, where Mongolia is, um, Central North America, so parts of the American Midwest, those are very much going to be drier. You have more of a grass landscape and less trees. And you're also going to have more extremes. And so, for example, you know, we get lots more <laughs> snow in Russia or in Canada in the, in, the, in the winters. And we also can have quite warm, hot uh, summers as well. Um, what's happening in the case of Australia is we're going to have deserts here. And so we already in the last um, slide talked about a lot of the different deserts here. Again, there are several deserts in Australia. And so much of the central core of Australia is going to be that 
the dry, arid climate category. Um, there just isn't enough moisture here. It's, it's too far separated from the ocean. So by the time your, your air masses get inland, they're just not carrying any more water. So again, um, New Zealand being a very mountainous country and Australia being a very desert focused country. The cool thing about these islands here is they are a great example of the island bio biogeography which we talked about in our Madagascar lecture as well. So the, basically, we look at an island biogeography. The bigger an island, the more species it will have. And that a larger island is just going to have more um, niches and opportunities for different organisms to evolve and to exist. Australia is, of course, a very large island, right? It might be the smallest continent, but it's a pretty large island, right? Uh, New Zealand also going to be existing of uh, two, well, multiple islands, but two big islands. Okay, so both of these are going to be examples of island biogeography. So part of that is going to be number one, the bigger the island, the more species, but also you're going to have organisms evolving in isolation. We have animals that we find in New Zealand and Australia that we don't find anywhere else in the world, and they evolved separately. Um, we'll talk about more some specific ones in more detail on the next slide, but the Austral realm is a great example of something called convergent evolution. Uh, and that's going to be when you have two organisms or more organisms that are not related. They're not in the same species or even in the same um, you know, phyla at all but they're going to have the same body characteristics because they have the same habitat conditions. So they evolve separately, but still came to that, that end conclusion of the most optimal body type for their environment. And so I've got some pictures of two awesome organisms here that are not at all related, but they look very similar. And that's going to be your dolphins and your sharks. So dolphins, these guys here. So our dolphins here are mammals. Um, their babies, they give life birth to their young um, and they nurse their young, for example, with, with breast milk. And so you can see these, you know, dolphins here are going to be elongated body type, right? We're not going to have arms and legs. We're going to have a series of fins instead. All right. But these are mammals. They breathe air. They have to come to the surface for air. Um, sharks, however, are fish. This is a nurse shark here, I believe. Um, so they are fish. Um, some shark give live birth, some shark lay eggs, it depends on the species of shark, um, but they are a fish, so they're going to have a cartilage-based um, skeletal system, they can breathe underwater, they have gills, they don't need to go to the surface for air, all right, um, but they also have this elongated body shape, they don't have arms and legs, they have fins instead, okay, so very, very similar uh, body body shapes. Another example would be an ichthyosaur, which was a dinosaur. I don't have a picture of it, but I'm sure you can find one. So ichthyosaur was a reptile, right? So it was a dinosaur that's now extinct, but it also had a, a very, um, the same streamlined body with fins because it was a reptile that lived in the ocean. So all three of these organisms are not related. Dolphins and sharks are not related, but they look the same because of conversion evolution. Um, d uh, whales used to have legs. In fact, sometimes if you um, look at the skeletons of whales, you can sometimes see um, vestigial remnant leg bones, depending on the animal itself. Um, but whales used to have legs, but they were not useful in this ocean environment. And so as the animal evolved, that was a characteristic that wasn't needed. It did not improve the whale's chance of survival. It may have even hampered it. And so they just, they just lost it, right? They lost those, that, um, that feature. And so when we look at a lot of the really unusual animals in Australia, we quite often see examples of convergent evolution with animals that we see, um, especially in the Americas, um, sometimes in a Europe and Asia as well, but especially in the Americas. We can see um, traits in terms of like animals living in trees. So you might have tree dwelling animals in uh, Australia that have very similar body shapes to tree dwelling animals in South America, right? Um, there are not as many carnivores in terms of marsupials in Australia, but um, as organisms evolve separately, the traits that benefit them most for their specific habit, habitat conditions are consistent across different species. 
And so marsupials are going to be the animal class that Australia and New Zealand are most famous for, more Australia. Um, so marsupials are mammals, they give birth to live young, um, but when they're born their babies are not fully developed. And so if you see like when a kitten or a puppy is born, yes, they look, you know, their eyes are still shut and they're all, you know, you know scrawny, but they, they, they develop independence fairly quickly, right? They're you know, walking around and their eyes are open, not too much time. Um, by contrast, so those are placentals. The placental are mammals that the babies are, are more developed inside the mother's womb. In comparison to a marsupial, which is what we find mostly in Australia, it's going to be the babies are born prematurely. They are not fully developed. They're pretty helpless. Um, and so they have to continue their development after birth in a pouch on a mother's body. So you can see this adorable little baby kangaroo in mama's pouch, right? Um, they continue developing in mama's pouch um, after after birth, okay? So um, there's a couple different theories as to when this, this trait split off. We do find most marsupials in Australia, but they're not just in Australia. For example, um, South America and Central America have lots of marsupials, and the uh, Virginia possum in North America is an example of a marsupial. So we have marsupials in the Americas as well. Um, so there's a couple different theories as to at what point the marsupials broke off from the other um, other animals. There's theories as this is back when um, Australia was connected to Antarctica during Pangaea. So we're talking, you know, 200 million years ago. I've seen quotes of 160 million years ago, you know, so a long time ago. Right? Um, but there's different theories as to how these animals got to Australia and then, uh, and then evolved from there. Again, evolving in isolation. We do not find kangaroos anywhere else but this realm. We don't find koalas anywhere else but this realm. Um, I mentioned in the last slide that there are very few carnivorous um, marsupials that are still currently alive. Um, so many of them have gone extinct. The Tasmanian devil is going to be an example of a um, carnivorous marsupial and they are endangered. Um, we had other other types of uh, marsupial carnivores that are, have now gone extinct. Um, so yeah, they're very much isolated, uh, evolved in isolation on this island. And uh, it is very fascinating to see this kind of, you know, science experiment of these animals uh, evolving separately and getting different traits, but then also still looking similar to so many other animals that we see in other parts of the world. Um, because again, the, the influence of environmental factors. So because, because it's such a fascinating experiment, it is, is absolutely fascinating biologists for, for ages. And so you have, um, scientists trying to find where is the exact magical line <laughs> past which we don't find marsupials. Um, we haven't really found one magical line, but there are two different lines that historically are more popular, and that's going to be Wallace's line and Weber's line. And so Wallace's line, this is going to be 1876, uh, is going to be cutting through the center of Indonesia. Um, kind of, and that's, this was the proposed line that, um, you know, east of this line you'll find marsupials but north and west of this line you will not find marsupials we don't find marsupials in most of asia we do have marsupials in papua new guinea and that is significant because when um during the ice ages when more water was tied up in ice um, sea levels were lower in fact papua new guinea was connected to australia by land so animals could walk back and forth and large portions of Southeast Asia were connected by land as well, including to to uh, mainland South, Southeast Asia. All right, but these two didn't didn't connect, so we didn't have Southeast Asia and Australia did not connect. Okay, so um, Wallace's line proposed in 1876. Um, scientists continued to do more research and visit more islands. As you can see, we have lots of islands in this part of the world. And so Weber's line, it wasn't proposed that much longer after Wallace um, is going to have it uh, going closer to Papua New Guinea and saying, no, I think that the, the limit of marsupial extension into Southeast Asia is closer along to Papua New Guinea. Again, remember, we do have marsupials in the Americas. But we do not have them in Europe. We don't have them in Asia, with the exception of Papua New Guinea. And so there is still science to try and decide, you know, um, what common ancestor was it that 
that connected our American marsupials to our Australian marsupials. And of course, um, Australia is much more dominated by marsupials than, uh, than non-marsupials. There are not, or so I should say placentals are going to be non-marsupials, um, or monotremes, which are mammals that lay eggs. Um, so we do have non-marsupials in Australia. For example, there's a, some sort of mouse that I think, um, they actually just, just jumped their way over, right? Um, so we do have we do have non-marsupial animals in Australia, um, especially birds, for example. But um, but we do have a, a higher rate of marsupials than other parts of the world, for sure. All right, and so then well, let's talk about when the humans get here. So in our, our last lecture, again, we focused on um, humans originated as a species from sub-Saharan Africa. And so then we as a species then kind of spread out from there. So let's go ahead and take a look at when humans came to this realm. And so Australia's native peoples are going to be the aboriginals. And we estimate that they arrived in Australia roughly 40,000 to 50,000 years ago. And so they would have um, come from Southeast Asia. And so probably they would have walked through much of Southeast Asia until eventually they uh, had boats and then, and then took boats to Australia. And so um, this is going to be the, the native peoples of, the, of Australia. And they were um, able to live in isolation without um, in developing a very robust culture and language um, without European interaction for, you know, tens of thousands of years. New Zealand's native peoples um, are going to have a different origin story than Aboriginals. So Aboriginals came coming originally from Southeast Asia. New Zealand's native people are the Maori and they originally came from Polynesia. Okay. Um, and we do also see more Polynesian peoples coming to New Zealand today. Um, but New Zealand uh, was contacted by humans much later. In fact, I've seen this as 900s. I've also seen estimates as late as the 1200s. So much, much later in terms of um, the movement of human beings. And so um, this newer, newer movement of people to this island is going to impact a lot of the animals here as well, having again evolved without contact with this the human species. So the Aboriginals and Maori, both being the indigenous peoples of this realm, they are not themselves related um, any more than you know we as a species are all related. But they did they did come from different parts of the world when they settled these islands. Okay, um, so the first written record of European um, noticing Australia is going to be the Dutch in 1606. In fact, for a while Australia was called New Holland. And then Great Britain colonized uh, both Australia and New Zealand in the 1700s. And you may have heard lots of jokes about Australians being all criminals. And that comes from Great Britain's first colonies in Australia were prisons. And it kind of made sense for them. They're like, well, we have all these prisoners in Great Britain. The prisons are overflowing. Let's just banish them to this island in the middle of nowhere. And so uh, you had a large number of penal colonies or prison colonies in Australia. And of course, uh, contact with European was absolutely devastating for both the Aboriginals and the Maori. Um, so the Maori actually had a whole series of wars they fought with um, the British. Um, eventually, unfortunately, losing. Um, for Aboriginals, uh, very much devastated by illnesses. So, of course, whenever you have humans come in contact that uh, grew up separately, there are going to be different um, different pathogens, different diseases that one population is going to have an immunity to and the other population will not have immunity to. And so um, anytime you have colonization, uh, disease and illness is absolutely going to play a role in, in decimating the native population. But of course, the British also had a very active role in persecution and um and elimination of the aboriginals and so for example if you've heard of the the movie rabbit proof friends um great britain had and australia had a, a government policy of separating aboriginal children from their families and sending them to camps where they had to then learn english and and kind of um forget their native culture and become more um europeanized of course, we saw the same thing happen in North America and we are seeing it happen in China. Um, and so 
yeah, really devastating treatment of the Aboriginal peoples. Um, Australia still today is still trying to to come to terms with this really painful past. In fact, in 2008, um, Australia actually issued a formal apology to their Indigenous peoples for the really awful treatment and their taking of lands. And there's still a navigation of how to return lands to Native peoples that were taken from them when the British came and colonized. And this is, of course, still a, still a point of contention, uh, something that, that Australia's governments and people are still um, coming to terms with. But as far as issuing a formal apology, that's a lot farther than many other countries have come. So the modern day states of both Australia and New Zealand were formed in 1901. They are both commonwealths, which means that they, even though they are independent countries, they are still considered uh, allegiant to Great Britain. So kind of similar to Canada. They are part of the Commonwealth, so you'll sometimes the British royal family will go visit them and so on and so forth. Um, fun fact, in 1893, New Zealand became the first country in the world to give women the right to vote. Um, I don't know if that was all women or just white women. Unfortunately, many countries um, don't give uh, voting rights equally to all ethnicities. But I do know that 1893, New Zealand became the first country to give women the right to vote. Um, and then if we look again at, at Great Britain and uh, New Zealand. So the Maori had signed several treaties of sovereignty with Great Britain saying, hey, we are sovereign native um, nations. Um, of course, Great Britain did not uh, honor all of these um, treaties. And today the Maori um, within New Zealand have not been able to um, to integrate well with the rest of the country. So we still see a lot of divides in terms of access to technology, access to health services. Um, and so there's a, a very much a, a, a power structure and an access to services structure that is separating the Maori from the rest of the country. So I mentioned that we had animals evolving in isolation until humans showed up. So humans coming to Australia 50,000 years ago, that means that humans and the animals in Australia evolved together for tens of thousands of years. Um, however, humans came to New Zealand much later, right? We're looking between 900 and 1200 common era. That's pretty recent on the human scale of things. And so the animals on this island would have evolved without large predators or without a fear of humans. So they're kind of a little bit um, clueless when it comes to self-preservation. Um, so for example, the moa, there were nine species of these very large flightless birds. So this picture here is relatively to scale. So you see this, this human here, these birds are much, much larger. Some of them are like 10 feet tall. These considerably larger birds, right? Um, and so they couldn't fly. And their only other natural predator was another large bird, an eagle, that is also now extinct. And so when the humans showed up, they're like, hey, cool, what's this new this new creature with a stick? And why are you throwing it at me? I don't understand, right? Um, so the moa just didn't have any defenses and didn't, didn't have that natural fear that other organisms that have grown up with humans have, right? So um, the, these large top flightless birds were, were hunted into extinction, probably also a lot of other environmental factors as well with the introduction of humans to the islands. Um, the estimate is that the moa went extinct within 100 years of human contact. Um, and we see this, this story of mass extinctions with um, human interactions with almost every island. Um, that humans then come to. So for example, the dodo bird, which is also a, a, a large flightless bird is now extinct, um, also was from an island, was also hunted by humans. Um, and also there is some theories that they were wiped out by a large landslide or flood. So environmental factors can also impact that. You know, one side effect of having an island is if your entire population is limited to this island and you don't have very many breeding animals, and then something happens, a flood, a drought, a fire. Um, if you just have small numbers, it's easier to wipe out your species. And so, um, yeah, a lot of the animals in both Australia and New Zealand um, have just been have been wiped out, either from human contact or um, or other environmental environmental factors. Or the introduction of other animals, too. I mentioned that in our Madagascar lecture, talking about when humans come to an island from another place, they might bring snakes or cats or dogs with them. And these animals, um, being predatory, 
um, can then eat all the native animals that evolve without predators and so don't have those adaptations for survival and in defense. Okay, so if we look at the population of uh, both Australia and New Zealand, they are not evenly distributed throughout. Um, and a lot of that is going to be because of physical barriers. And so if we look at Australia, for example, our populations are very much focused along the coasts. So on the eastern coast, we have Sydney, a very large uh, city that you hopefully have heard of. So Sydney, Canberra, Melbourne, Brisbane, all these are very major cities and they're all along the eastern coast, okay? And they're also gonna be on the um, coastal side of that great dividing range where we have a mountain range, this dotted line here is gonna be your mountain range here. So kind of keeping them a little more um, nicer climates. On the flip side, we have Perth is going to be in the southwestern coast here. But overwhelmingly, the majority of the Australian population is going to be focused in these two coastal areas. Um, the rest of the country, is known as the outback, is going to very much be part of that periphery. So remember, the core is going to be places that have more power, more commerce, more, um, more political leverage, um, more jobs. And then periphery is going to have um, less power less jobs, less economy, um, and so quite often core is going to be where the, the money is made and the periphery is where the raw materials go to feed into this, um, which we do see a bit here in terms of distribution of uh, minerals. So this outback through here is going to be very uh, dry. People do live here, just a lot less of them. In fact, the Northern Territory is uh, largely going to be um, uh, Aboriginal controlled territory and there's also a lot of aboriginal uh, claims to lands through here as well and i said this is this is an ongoing issue for australia to to navigate um it's you know its actions in the past to its indigenous peoples and how to rectify that um it's worth mentioning that the deserts in australia are not all sand that's a common misconception that all deserts are made of sand in fact much of the deserts here are what's called desert pavement and so it's a series of small pebbles and rocks that creates kind of like an asphalt. It looks kind of like, a, like a, an asphalt road almost. It's a very flat, pebbly landscape. Um, so actually a lot of the world's deserts are not sand. That's a, a misconception here. Alice Springs is pointed out on this map here, which I think is funny. It's not a very large town, but definitely is the town that is the most isolated in terms of the Australian outback. I think they even advertise themselves as being the middle of nowhere is kind of like their slogan or something um but yeah so it's a it's it is a it's the most populated city you'd have anywhere in this very unpopulated part of the country so you have a very very uneven distribution of population in australia um and then this of course brings up concerns of um poverty and access to health and social services for the few people who do live um throughout here um, not having access to, to schools and to jobs and to doctors. 82% of all Australians live in cities, okay? And again, those cities are overwhelmingly focused on the coasts. And so these are going to have um, less of that desert um, atmosphere, less of that desert um, climate, and because they are on the coasts, are going to have more access to more of the moderating influences of the ocean, so a bit more uh, temperate, milder um, temperatures. And then on New Zealand, we have, again, the two main islands, the Northern Island and the Southern Island. And this is going to be mostly, humans are more focused in the north because of the, the Southern Alps on the Southern Island. And so there's just much more mountainous areas in the south. It's harder to live there. And so between the two islands, more people live in the north. There are still major islands in the south. It's just that people tend to be more, uh, or more, still major cities in the south but there are people are more focused in the north population wise so in the last slide you may have noticed that there were lots of boxes thrown in australia with names like queensland or new south wales or northern territory and that's a representative of the political structure of australia so in our european and our asian model um, modules we saw most of what was known as the unitary state where you had one Focus central government. Um, so, for example, in in China, it's very much one central government. Um, in you know, in most of Europe, it's one central government. 
Um, however, Australia is going to be what's known as a federation. So a federation is a group of territories that then cooperate together and are allied under one central government. Okay, um, and we see this in other parts of the world as well, but Australia is a great example of that. So these territories or states, uh, provinces sometimes, depending on what country you are, they do have common interests, right? So they're going to have a, a common military, a common um, uh, um, economy, right, in some aspects. But they still have maintained a lot of their own autonomy and a lot of their individuality. And so so much what we find in the United States and in Canada, for example, is the separate territories can have their own elections for their own laws that are different than other states within Australia. OK, so this is, again, is a federation when you have territories that are united together in some things, but then still do still have their own laws, their own um, um, governing politics that are separate than a lot of the other um, other territories. Okay, and so if we look at the economies of our two countries here. So New Zealand, this photograph here is very classic. We have lots of our, our sheep here. You can see the mountains in the background. You can see some, some clouds nearby. So remember, majority of New Zealand is going to be that nice classic sea, mild mid-latitude climate category. It's moist, it's mild, there's lots of rain, there's not going to be some harsh snow, and then a lot of expansive pastures, especially in the north. And this is going to make us ideal for an agricultural based economy. All right, so two thirds of New Zealand's exports are going to be wool, dairy, and meat products. Okay, um, dairy is going to be um, uh, grown on the north, uh, raised on the North Island, and sheep were actually raised on both the North and the South Islands. Okay, um, and then they also do have um, a mining operation here. And so coal, uranium, and gold are also going to be um, important exports as well. And so New Zealand is it's a small country. There is 68th in terms of world GDP, which is global domestic product. Um, but they have, um, in general, a very comfortable quality of life. Of course, this is not evenly distributed. We mentioned earlier that a lot of the indigenous Maori are being excluded from those um, quality of life, access to quality of life. But in general, New Zealand, especially since they have a smaller population, uh, are able to have a pretty high standard of living for their citizens. And the Southern, the Southern Alps is going to be where we have a lot of those mineral aspects. And so if you have more dairy in the north and more mineral mining in the south, and of course the finding of gold also not so in New Zealand, but also very much so in Australia, there's going to be, um, Australia has its own little mini gold rush as well, people rushing in to, to, to take advantage of that gold. Okay, so the Australian economy uh, is larger than New Zealand. So New Zealand was uh, 68, and as of 2017, Australia was 19th in the world, right below Iran. Okay, their main trading partners are all going to be in Asia. Okay, they do trade with the rest of the world, but it's more heavily focused on Asia. So in 2017, um, China was 33% of their exports and over 22% of their imports. And so um, very much uh, influence with the, the Asian market, especially Southeast Asian market. Okay, um, and then so exported goods are going to be a lot of minerals. Again, iron, coal, gold. We did have a gold rush in Australia. Aluminum. Lots of wheat growing, so wheat requires less water than some other crops. We do have other um, crops, so it brings some, as a healthy wine economy in Australia um, along the coast, but there is a very large amount of wheat growing here because that needs less, less uh, water than some other crops. And of course, uh, beef and wool being uh, major um, exports here as well in Australia. So Australia being an island, of course, is separated from much of the world. And so when it comes to bringing in very large goods, it can get very expensive to ship things inwards. Um, so one of their big imports is going to be cars, for example, but that's very expensive. And so you have something called the import substitution industry. And this is not just in Australia, but Australia is a great example of it. And so when you have a place that's it's cut off from other locations, so it's more remote, it's more isolated. So they start to invest in their own local manufacturing because it just is too expensive to keep importing these goods. So we do have car manufacturing in Australia. They're not amazing cars, right? They're not going to be sold in other markets. You don't really see 
Australian cars being sold on the scale that, for example, German cars or, or um, uh, Japanese cars are being sold. Um, but a lot of that was just to, because it's so expensive to import a car to Australia, well, why not just make them there, all right? So this import substitution industries is this economic geography theory, uh, or I should say principle, of, um, of, of remote locations making their own manufacturing on their own industry so they don't have to rely on importing because it is, the distance is too expensive. Um, if we look at all of the different sectors of the economy in Australia, overwhelmingly services, it's going to be the, the bulk of the employment is in the services. A lot of this is uh, tourism, of course. Australia is very popular for tourist destinations. Again, you can see um, animals and plants that you can't find anywhere else in the world. And there's gorgeous beaches here. We have the Gold Coast, which is going to have some amazing beaches. We mentioned the Great Barrier Reef, uh, of course, as well. And so, uh, again, service economy is going to be uh, an overwhelmingly large portion of, of Australia's workforce. So um, Australia, of course, we talked about, unless you are of Aboriginal descent, um, most of the people living in Australia are descended from people from elsewhere. Okay, so being a British colony in the 1950s, overwhelmingly most Australians were of European descent, either British or Irish, all right? Um, and a lot of this also is because there was very strict limitations on people from other parts of the world being allowed to immigrate in. And this is related, again, to the idea of eugenics, which we mentioned in, in our population uh, lecture. Eugenics is a government decision to limit the population of a certain ethnic group. And in this case, it was very much targeted uh, specifically to Asians. And so really until 1973, there was some pretty strict policies that was a, it was a quota based system where um, only so many Asians were allowed to immigrate to Australia. And once that quota was filled, it was cut off. But the quota for Asians was so much lower than the quota for, you know, Brits or Dutch, right? And so there just was very much a, 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 a restriction on um, people coming from Asia. And there still is a lot of issues in Australia around this, of, of a lot of racism in Australia towards um, Asians and also towards um, people of Arabic descent. So if we compare 1950s being 95% um, European descent. Now it's going to be 33% of Amer Australians are of European descent. Uh, remember, Aboriginals are going to be less than 10%. And so we have a very large number of people of Asian descent who have now immigrated to Australia. And uh, this has been um, this has been a big sticking point for Australia. Um, so this is actually was a government campaign in 2014 um, against refugees. So um, Australia did not want to be accepting um, specifically a lot of Middle Eastern um, and South Asian uh, asylum seekers. So people were, were coming to Australia by boat, very similar to what we see North African um, uh, asylum seekers, refugees coming into Europe. Same thing, you have people coming um, to um, to Australia from, largely from South and Southeast Asia, looking for asylum, looking for, for refugee status. And Australia was like, no. <laughs> so this was, this, this is a government sponsored campaign right here. So this is a quote from, um, the One Nation Political Party. Uh, multiculturalism has failed everywhere. It is negative and divisive, a weight that is drowning our once safe and cohesive society. One nation will abolish multiculturalism and the Racial Discrimination Act and promote assimilation, nationalism, loyalty and pride in being Australian. Uh, the One Nation Party is a, a very conservative right-wing party. They are a minority party, but they do still have senators um, in Congress. Um, Pauline Hansen was the woman who uh, began this, and this was her quote. Um, Pauline Hansen, I think it's now actually called Pauline Hansen's One Nation Party. She named the party after herself. Um, but there has been a lot of um, xenophobia in Australia, and this is the fear of foreigners or fear of, of outsiders. And so I, I mentioned it was very much targeted towards Asians. Uh, in recent years, it's been more targeted towards um, uh, um, Muslims. So, for example, uh, Pauline Hansen, who's going to be the, the senator who is this very, very conservative right-wing group, 
actually um, went into uh, the government house, the Senate, wearing a burqa, saying we need to have a burqa ban. Um, she is not of Islam descent. She's um, she's white. And so um, this has been a big uh, struggle for Australia: is this this embedded racism and xenophobia in a, in a country that is mostly immigrants anyway. Again, unless you're Aboriginal, which is less than 10% of the population, you are descended from people from outside of Australia. And so this is a, a big issue for Australia is, is dealing with this, this intense racism and hatred of others. And there's been a lot of protests and a lot of um, policies. Again, this, this is a, this no way refugee thing is from 2014. A lot of groups trying to change that attitude to make um, it's safe for people to come here. There are now refugees are not brought to mainland Australia. They're going to be in islands and they're kind of held there in limbo in a bit. And so this is an ongoing issue is how does Australia handle its, um, its attitudes towards immigration, its attitudes towards uh, multiculturalism and um, making sure it has a safe environment for all peoples, which is something that, that Australia is so far not very successful. Um, another big thing happening in Australia is it's a very um, arid place, right? We saw that much of Australia is going to be arid deserts. And so um, when we are in California, we have an El Nino year, we have a lot of rain. So if you are in California or Mexico or Chile, when you experience El Nino, you, you think of more rain. The opposite is happening in Australia because of the way that an El Nino event interacts with different parts of the ocean differently. So Australia being on the other side of the ocean from the Americas, um, an El Nino for them is going to be a drought. So already Australia is a desert and then we're going to have a big drought event on top of that it can be pretty devastating. Okay. So Australia is looking into what are some other sources of water. One of them is going to be recycled water or reclaimed water. This is also known as the toilet to tap idea. Um, it's going to be, basically taking um, um, wastewater and then cleaning it to be reused for water sources. Um, people get squeamish about that a bit, um, but uh, you know, if you live in a desert, you might have to, to just take what you get. The other one is gonna be desalinization. This photo here is the Adelaide desal plant, um, which is gonna be in Adelaide, the southern part of Australia. Desalinization is taking water from the oceans and removing the salt from it. And then, so you, there's a whole bunch of different ways you can do this, reverse osmosis and so on and so forth. You remove the salt and now you have fresh water, which you can drink. And then you have this leftover salt. Um, there is an issue of what do you then do with this salt? You can't just jump it back into the ocean because now you would change the salinity of the ocean, which could impact and kill organisms there. But currently uh, um, Australia is looking into desal. Again, this plant here is in Adelaide. There are other plants being built because you you have agriculture here and you have humans living here. And um, especially as climate change is getting worse, um, these El Nino events might become more severe. They might come more frequently. So again, Australia experiences drought during an El Nino year, unlike what we see in the Americas. That is all I have for you for Australia and New Zealand. Thank you so much and take care.